Some promising news for Johnson & Johnson and its COVID-19 booster shot. The drug maker saying the additional jab showed a significant increase in efficacy when administered two months after the first dose. The results... Also good six months apart. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamalani. And Anjali, I know you spoke earlier with J&J's head of R&D. Um, what specifically did we learn more about the timeline potentially for this booster shot and what they found? Well, Akiko, we did get a chance to talk to the global head of R&D, Matai Maman, and really got some interesting uh, outline of sort of what they're looking at. And number one, of course, the idea that the booster shot provides extra protection in a small cohort of U.S. Uh, individuals, uh, U.S.-based individuals. So really looking for that data. We just got the announcement as it stands. They've submitted that data to the FDA and are waiting to hear back on whether or not they can move forward with filing for an emergency use authorization. In addition, we got an update on their kids trial, which was supposed to start this fall, but is being a sort of delayed until, quote unquote, later this year. Take a listen to the whole interview. Yeah, we were extremely excited to put out uh, quite a bit of data this morning. Uh, one set of data shows that the the vaccine, after a single shot, is really strong and really long lasting, and with no evidence at all of uh, fading or waning effectiveness. That's really exciting for us because our intent all along with that shot, since it's a single shot and easily administered, easily stored, was to try to secure the world as much as possible against this pandemic. But equally exciting is our booster data. We said a little while back that uh, boosting at six months gives uh, a really beautiful uh, bump up in the immune titers and antibodies. And what we show today is that that's accompanied by really great efficacy. So after a booster shot, we see vaccine efficacy at 94%. And that's at two months where there's a fourfold bump up in antibody titers. And we've already shown that at, uh, that at uh, six months, there's a nine and 12 fold bump up in antibody titers. So if one can space the, the time between the, the two uh, vaccinations this way and get boosted out at six months or later, it's a wonderful level of, uh, of very efficacious um, protection and um, should be quite durable. So this is really interesting because you're showing pretty consistent protection with just that single shot. Why then pursue a booster? So our our real-world effectiveness study, which is the largest uh, study of its kind that's been done to date, um, shows 390,000 uh, Janssen vaccinated people against 1.5 million unvaccinated people. That shows about an 80% level of protection month on month on month on month. So it doesn't wane at all. But the second shot gets you to 94%. So if one is in a circumstance where uh, there's plenty of vaccine supply or the circumstances uh, permit it, uh, a booster shot is a good idea to get to even higher levels of protection, especially among those that need that higher level of protection. So as it stands right now, would you be moving forward with filing with the FDA for for the booster? We've provided all the data that we've released today and more to FDA. And so they're processing that now and they will let us know whether it's an adequate amount of data information for them to uh, think about an emergency use authorization for a booster. Ultimately, that will be decided by FDA and the population that such a booster would impact is decided by CDC. I'm glad you brought that up because clearly last week we saw that debate unfold and the idea that maybe the broader population isn't necessarily in need of a booster. Where do you stand on that, either based on what the data is telling you or just what you think in terms of global supply? I think it's very circumstance specific. Uh, FDA, the advisory committee, uh, I thought did a really good job uh, studying all aspects of uh, the Pfizer vaccine. And they decided that uh, the the vaccine was best suited for people over 65 and those that were uh, more susceptible to severe consequences of of getting COVID-19. Um, so we'll we'll see. I think that there are different circumstances for different vaccines and different circumstances in different parts of the world. 
What about the trial with kids? I know that that's a really big focus right now as we're in the school year and really some concerns about an upcoming wave later this year. Where do you stand on the trial with kids? Yeah, so the J&J vaccine, our trials with children and pediatric population won't uh, start till later this year. Do you have a specific month or, or do you have any more clarity on when that would start? Yeah, right now, all I can really say is late this year, we have to agree protocols with the different regulators around the world. So we're not able to say exactly until there's such agreement. One of the new things that's coming out, um, I don't know if you saw the news yesterday, that the U.S. is looking at allowing international travel with required vaccines. Uh, Right now, as it stands, what would you say the current situation is for Johnson & Johnson specifically with distribution of the vaccine globally and really just finding more arms to to have shots in? It's a great question. We are uh, gearing up manufacturing in a a major way in multiple manufacturing centers right now around the world, from Europe and Africa to the United States and and Asia. So the the one's going to see as the weeks and months go go on that there's quite a volume of J&J vaccine. Uh, And then with the data today, it should um, really inspire uh, regions to, to make good use of this vaccine as it's so easy to use. It's one of the the principal advantages and today showing that it's strong and long lasting efficacy and that a second shot gets you to such high levels of uh, protection is really exciting. I'm glad you brought that back up because I did want to circle back and talk about the underlying technology. There's been a lot of hype around mRNA and the technology there and its ability to quickly pivot uh, to new strains. I I wonder, uh, what does this news really tell us in terms of the technology of viral vector vaccines? Yeah, so a viral vector vaccine um, has a distinct advantage in that it it, uh, is recognized by the, the body as um, uh, an, an, uh, an entity that it must mount a very strong and complex and multiple arms of an immune response to. So it's not just the antibodies, but it's also different parts of uh, the cell cellular immunity. So what that allows in a vaccine is this long lasting element. It allows it to be durable. Um, it also allows it to act against uh, different variants um, because it's a different component of the immune system. So for us, our ad 26 based vaccine has these distinct features, and we're seeing it play out right now in the durability. So as you can hear, a lot about the durability of that vaccine, which is proving to be really interesting compared to the mRNA vaccines, as we know, uh, and really sets up for an interesting booster debate shortly. Back to you. Okay, Anjali Kamlani bringing us that conversation. Thanks so much for that.